Before we begin, three messages. Here's a riddle. How do you build native cross-platform mobile applications quickly without having to rewrite code and hire consultants at a huge cost? Titanium from Appcelerator. Called the easy button for mobile application development, it allows you to focus more on what's important, getting product out the door. Join the more than 1.5 million active developers who have created over 13,000 apps at www.accelerator.com. So, you've taken some of the advice that has come from untethered.tv guests, built an app, and now you're turning your attention to generating some hard-earned revenue. Then you should be looking at Pontiflex app leads. Some of your peers who are using app leads are earning CPMs 100 times the industry average. And if you need any other reasons to start, I'll give you two more. You can run sign-up ads from top brands, the ones that you recognize, and it won't take your precious users out of your app. Go to appleads.com, that's A-P-P-L-E-A-D-S.com to sign up. When my company needed to develop a key mobile product, one that I was counting on as a new source of revenue, I knew exactly who to turn to, Macadamian. They delivered on time with incredible attention to detail, and I was able to get product into customers' hands faster than I ever thought possible. I've personally known them for 10 years, and they do make great products even better. Check them out at www.macadamian.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Untethered.tv. I'm your host, Rob Woodbridge, and this is where I bring you mobile rock stars. And I'm, I brought you a rock star, but a rock star in the coffee business that is leveraging mobile to actually drive sales, uh, drive, um, I think, drive awareness as well as uh, certainly drive um, openness, leveraging QR codes to actually follow the trail of a coffee from bean, from the farm, all the way into your cup. Uh, and this is a Vancouver, Canada-based company. So uh, love the fact that this is uh, Canada-based and uh, you know is a true Canadian. I love it. Innovation happening here and leveraging this technology is happening here. And uh, with me today is, is Lloyd Bernhardt, who is uh, the co-founder um, of a company called Ethical Bean. I, I guess it's Ethical Bean Coffee, right? Is That's the uh, that's the name of the company? Yeah, that's, that, that's the thing. Otherwise, is it coffee? Is it vanilla? Ethical Bean. Yeah, exactly. Is it? Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, based out of Vancouver, uh, Lloyd, thank you for coming on here and, and well, sharing your story. That's awesome. Well, uh, you know, I got a, a little bit of background. I said I, I, I came across the story about how you were uh, using QR codes to drive people to go into a, a store and buy your packaged coffee. Um, and then doing a little bit more research, it, it dawned on me that you're doing much more than that. And I want to get into the real uh, meat of this. But for, for people who are, aren't in Vancouver, who haven't found your, your product on the shelves, because it's available in Loblaws uh, across Canada and a bunch of other um, stores, Talk about the Ethical Bean Company. Who, who, who are you guys? Uh, well, we're a, a coffee company, oddly enough. We're based in Vancouver, which is sort of coffee land in Canada, <laughs> obviously close to Seattle, and we know who's down there. Um, yeah, we're a 100% fair trade, organic coffee company. We pride ourselves on transparency and grossing the best possible fair trade organic certified coffees that we can source around the world. So, I mean, you're... You've been doing this for how long? Seven or eight years? Uh, we're kind of coming up to eight years now. Okay. And, well, and you come from the technology background, though. I do. I Yeah, I started my first tech company in 84, I believe. And that was, a, uh, I mean, it was an interesting time. I mean, you've seen uh, kind of two bubbles kind of come and go, which was the uh, PC market and then, um, and then the Internet market. Uh, both oh, yeah. expand and collapse, I suppose. Yeah, it's sort of. I, I like to think of my time in technology sort of like dog years. You know, things change so quickly. It's, you know, after almost nineteen years of that, I wanted to do something else. <laughs> and so, what was this, it about coffee that that that? I mean, what what brought you into coffee? Aside from the fact that it's basically it's it's my lifeline. And I'm not sure. Oh, I, yours, yeah. So. I mean, I've always really enjoyed coffee, and uh, it, it it was sort of a happenstance. Um, my wife, who's the other co-founder of the business, we adopted our daughter um, from Guatemala. And that was in 1999, and uh, that was a real life-changing experience for us. Hey, you know, having a daughter, um, be living in Guatemala for four months, and you know, you get kind of bored hanging out there. So we visit some coffee farms, and at that point in time, farmers were paid about 60 cents a pound. 
and it's a it's a colossal amount of work growing coffee. Yeah, and at sixty cents a pound, they're losing money, and they're poor. So that made absolutely no sense, you know, because I was buying premium coffee at that time, and I would go to a store and spend maybe fifteen dollars a pound. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, okay, 60 cents to 15 bucks. There's an awful lot of money here. Where does it go? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it reminded me a bit of technology, you know, where, oh, great margin. Uh, <laughs> That's right. Good so, business, but not good. But, it, but it, I just couldn't understand why these people were getting screwed. So we did a bunch of research. And we started Ethical Bean in 2003. Um, I think, as people know, there's, you know, coffee shops in every corner. Um, there's a lot of coffee roasters out there. Yeah. And it's a very competitive space. But what I really liked about coffee was it's both an art and a science. So you have all the chemical reactions that happens when you're roasting coffee, and then you score it. And it's a really interesting marriage uh, of the two. And uh, I found that intriguing. And based on my business experience, we thought we could do a better job than the other guys. And yeah, bought a little roaster, fired it up, and started selling coffee. Started selling coffee almost eight years ago. And uh, was it a hard, just out of purely personal context, was it a hard transition to get out of technology and into something oh. like this? No, I was done. <laughs> I was it. Fork. I was, you know, we just sort of got back into the technology in the last mm, 18 months, yeah. so to speak. I mean, as more active and developing. Um, but, yeah, it was a nice little hiatus there for a while. You know, well, so relax, calm down. Well, calm down. Drink Jeff. Uh, yeah, but I mean, this isn't a small. Uh, this, you, I mean, you're not a small operation. You got. Uh, I was reading. You've got a ten thousand square foot uh, roasting house or uh, warehouse, and yeah. uh, and you've got almost thirty staff right now. So this is, you know, this has grown. Oh yeah, we actually have thirty eight now. Thirty eight. Yeah, I don't know where they came from. <laughs> they just they just hang out, and you're distributed where, like uh, across the all, country, all, obviously, all across Canada. Yep. Um, you know, about a thousand retailers in Canada. And then we're now moving to the United States. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we developed our technology as well as we want to be able to communicate directly with the consumer um, without necessarily the uh, influence of the retailers. Right. Because they own the shelf space. That's, and that's, that's they can do whatever they want. But if you scan a QR code, for example, hey, I can talk directly to you. And you can also find out about us. Well, you know, it's because uh, I, I want to come back to uh, brand building, which is ultimately what that is, and 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 closing the gap between your product and the consumer, uh, because and we'll, and we'll come back to that. But I, uh, when you your companies that you were building uh, in the technology era, the era um, that when you I call it your technology era, the nineteen years leading up to the time you you uh, became yep. a roaster. Um, what uh, I mean was it? You were building software, weren't you? Yes, primarily software. Okay, and you actually worked for Apple. I did. I, I consulted on the QuickTime team, um, sort of mid '90s. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so forefront, always at the forefront. It would. Yeah, say. It was forefront, but it was also interesting because, uh, well, at that point, digital video was new. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, wow. What are we gonna do with this stuff? So I was doing business cases and, and analyzing the marketplace. Uh, I mean, so you know, you work for one of the one of the best branded companies, uh, you know, and the most respected branded companies in, in in the in the world now. Maybe not back then. Um, uh, but it was still a very well-respected brand. It's kind of evolved over that period of time. Um, yeah, how much of that influences, uh, you know, seeing something like Apple build its brand, it, you know, is parlayed into what you're doing? With you know, that's been something anybody's actually asked me that question. It's a, it's a really good question because it's critical. Um, I am very heavily influenced of what Apple does and their design of their software and hardware and the integration of everything. And uh, I, we, well, we're a Mac shop and... Uh, we have a lot of Apple stuff, yeah. And I personally have a lot of Apple stuff. Um, and my wife's a graphic designer as well, so you know it's not that accidental that our bags are silver. <laughs> so if if Steve watches this and sues me, I guess I'm in trouble. But, you know. <laughs> it's okay. He, you know, I think my mother's the only one that watches this. It's okay. Oh, I'm, your mother and yeah, a couple other people, right? And a couple of other people, yes. And she's a coffee drinker, so I, I, oh, it's awesome. the right demographic. Uh, yeah, I mean, brand has always played an important piece to this, and and, uh, and you know, we we've gone through that. Uh, um, I, I don't know the, you know, the person who owned the relationship uh, in a retail outlet like a, a Walmart for, was always Walmart, right? They they dictated everything. They dictated who who what what product went on what shelf and what eye level, 
And so retailers had to influence that in, in a way that, uh, you know, sometimes it was out of their hands. And uh, the relationship ended with Walmart. So when I got a product into Walmart or into Loblaws, it was like, here. And then the relationship started up, ended there with you and started with Walmart. Um, so the experience was with that. There's, there were certain ways to influence that relationship. But, but um, now there's a big way to close that gap, which is what you guys have done in the, in the QR space, right? So uh, talk about, I mean, when did you guys start using QR codes on, uh, in the product, on the product? Um, 11 months ago, actually, I was just looking at the data okay. and, uh, we were going through um, a packaging refresh and, uh, there was a bunch of different sort of design or constraints that we wanted. We first want to make the, the, the package a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. Um, typically we buy coffee in pound increments in Canada, yep. but the rest of the world is 12 ounces. Yeah. Go figure. <laughs> um, and then we wanted more flexibility in what we were putting in, in, the, in, in each bag. So in the previous generation of our coffee, it would have been, let's say, uh, classic Guatemalan. And sometimes we can't get enough coffee. And sometimes when you buy green coffee, it doesn't last until the next crop cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you bought it, you bought it and it's starting to suck. So you're scoring it. So when you score coffee, anything greater than an 80 is considered especially great. And uh, it's really hard to maintain the quality that you really want, because nobody wants to sell or consume crappy coffee. Um, so we wanted the flexibility, but you can't change the label because it confuses the retailer. And the retailer also has difficulties um, accounting for, you know, if the name changed on the price tags. Right. And all their POS and all their data systems are all pretty legacy. So it was just... Uh, you know, really quite a cumbersome problem because when the coffee leaves us, well, we don't really see it again. Yeah. You know, and some retailers are awesome, and some retailers well could improve um, on product placement, on shelf rotation, all that stuff. Um, and then I did a bunch of research and say, hey, well, these nifty little QR codes. Well, what an interesting idea that is, because um, we looked at just even just using standard UPC codes. Yeah. But it doesn't give you the flexibility. So what we did is we designed. Uh, a system that f f sort of follows our manufacturing processes, so it's it's really easy to use. Um, we use a FileMaker database, and when our coffee buyer, um, you know, gets a sample of coffee, cups it, grades it, he inputs that in the database. All the contract stuffs in the database. Mm -hmm. All the roasting information's in the database. And when we come to actually putting the coffee in the bag. We have all the little bits and pieces of information, and then it's just serialized by the QR code. And then, and then, uh, so they they get shipped, and then the end consumer just scans the QR code, and they get all yeah. of that information. Yeah. So I mean, the majority of the heavy lifting was done in the database. There's right. about eleven different relational databases that you know have to, you know, assemble everything on the fly. So when you scan it um, using our iPhone app or you know another QR code scanner on any platform, yep. or even if you just want to enter that little lot number in on your web browser, yeah. you know, it, it, it pulls all the information together. So, uh, I mean, it, it seems like this is, uh, so aside from the, the packaging issue and, uh, and uh, you know, condensing the package and, and fitting more onto it, um, was that the only driving factor f for this? No, I mean, no, there's a, there's a few other things going on at the same time. Um, the, like, the, for instance, the word fair trade is not a trademarked term and then it never will be so what is fair and some people are a little more or less fair than other people in either selling the green coffee or roasting it and as a fair trade certified product we wanted to make sure that we would tell like yourself that here is the fair trade certification here is the organic certification for that coffee that you're now drinking hmm. um, and the other thing is we want to make the world a smaller place by connecting you to the farmer, because growing coffee is is a lot of work. It takes like 3,500 beans, so you have to pick these little red cherries off 3,500 times to get one pound. Right. And I've picked coffee. I suck at it. <laughs> I watch them pick coffee, and they're really fast. And but it is hard work, and it's usually you know um, in mountainous parts of the world, so it's very steep. A lot of the coffee is packed out in 100-pound bags on people's backs, or if they're fortunate, they might have a mule or a horse. And then it's processed and dried, 
and stored and shipped. And then when we get it, we get it in about 70 kilo bags ready to roast. I mean, not, not to diminish the importance of roasting, but you know, as, as a final step, that's a lot less work than, you know, trying to grow a, a, a plant that's going to produce money for you. Right. Right. And then, and then, uh, I mean, so the process to, to, to make, to make that transparent, right. Which is to, to, as you said, bring this world, make this world a little bit smaller. So people have an understanding of what it is. Cause we, we hear a lot of talk about fair trade and, and, uh, uh, you know, people put fair trade on on something, and uh, people feel compelled to buy it as a result. But if you've read Freakonomics, uh, you know the the gist of free trade or a, a fair trade isn't what we all think it is. Um, and and um, so, by, by actually uh, putting the history of the bean on the package, ultimately for those people who are really concerned about uh, fair trade, and I think we should all be, um, you have that at your fingertips. Is is ultimately tells a great story about the bean. It does, and it, it makes some, for some interesting things you can do with that data. I mean, we look at our scan data, and it's been increasing 18% month over month. And, you know, we get about uh, a little less than 10% of our packages are scanned, Still. which is increasing all the time, yeah. but that's not bad. Nope. You know, if that was a marketing piece, you'd go, hmm, that's a pretty good success rate. You kidding? Because you can follow the coffee over time. So if we're changing, let's say, the... The, the classic or the rocket fuel, mm -hmm. you, can, you can see what we're doing to it. We're, ro we're roasting it differently. You'll see an interview from our Q grader saying, this is what's in this coffee. Maybe, the, you know, Sumatra, Guatemala, and Nicaraguan. They're roasted this way. Here's the curves. And I like it because of this, 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 and this. And since he's a licensed Q grader, he's actually allowed to say that kind of stuff. And it's not so much puffery. Right. And he's, you know, quite professionally honest. Sometimes it's... Mm. <laughs> You go, oh, uh, but that's all part of it. And then, you know, if we are down visiting the co-op, we have videos of interviews with the people. We have photos. Um, we're now aggregating some of their social media through the app. And, you know, we're continuing to evolve it so that, you know, beyond, hey, well, that's kind of cool. We're, we're in Guatemala. This is coffee come from and see some photos of that. Um, where we're going to connect you right to the farmer. So if you have a comment, you know, we'll facilitate the conversation. But if you have a question, ask them. <laughs> you know, why not? You know, I mean, most of the world has amazingly great, you know, mobile data. You know, I was just down in Guatemala and it was fantastic. Yeah. And it's way cheaper than here. Of course it is. Of course it is. Uh, yeah, they don't have the landline infrastructure that we they have to pay exactly. off. Yeah, leapfrog it. Absolutely. Exactly. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I can be in a, you know, a valley up in the middle of nowhere in Guatemala and, you know, text out or Skype or whatever. It's crazy. It's pretty good, but I can't be in my gym here in Ottawa and get any connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's part of our office. Yeah, it's like crazy. So, I mean, oh. let me let me ask about that because, I mean, what what's the hope there about facilitating, even facilitating that conversation or making this world smaller? You, you know, um, a, a QR code is is a great gateway, uh, but is this just? Um, you know, an education piece for the for the consumer, or is this a brand building exercise for the consumer? It's brand building as well, um, and we we use the educational part of the component as to build strength in the brand. Okay. Um, one piece of information when I was doing my due diligence uh, before starting the company that I neglected was um, assessing how competitive the coffee aisle is in a grocery store. Yeah. And. Uh, Lo and behold, after we started the company, we found it, it's the most competitive aisle in the grocery <laughs> store. And, you know, a retailer will be submit, get samples at least once a week of somebody's great coffee. Mm -hmm. Or at least they think it's great and it's got a story and it's got all this other stuff to it. Um, and you really, it's hard to make your customers sticky. So by providing education and a story over time, we're hoping to change that. Because um, the sad fact is, is if you have a series of competitors that are essentially selling very similar products, so you look at specialty coffee, or if you look at coffee, then specialty coffee, then fair trade and organic, you get smaller and smaller pies. And you have less and less differentiation as well. Right. Right. And some customers' pellets are more or less sophisticated than others, and they will buy what's on sale. Right. And you, any coffee company will see a major lift when they're on deal. And the trick is try to flatten that. Yeah. So the you know, peaks and valleys suck in business, right? They do. Yeah. So I mean, when when you when you're going through this process, is that 
I mean, 10% conversion rate, I think, is, is and I would call a QR scan a conversion rate. I mean, that's a committed conversion rate because it's yep. not about just redeeming a coupon, which is lazy marketing, right? This is actually yep. having to either download an application, your app, or somebody else's app, scan the thing, and, and go through. So there's a level okay. of commitment, right? Um, oh, you have to. If you scan it, you don't get anything out of it. You don't, you're not going to do it again. You're just going to be pissed off. Yeah. You know, and the other thing too is the the QR mark acts almost as another certification because if you scan it once and don't scan it again, yeah, you know what information's there and it, you can find it, so you you feel trust. Yeah, yeah. Well, transparency is the best way to do trust, right? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, basically, open Komodo is like here you go. This is this is exactly what what we've yep. got going on. Um, so what's the hope? Like, there's got to be a business driver. We talk about this just before we went live. Is that there's there is a there is a commerce. There has to be a revenue uh, component or a, a you know a, a drive for revenue as a result of this, or else why do it? Well, exactly. So we want a couple of things. One we want is you to go buy our coffee and not somebody else's. And by educating you and and sort of leading down the coffee path, we hope that will yep. do that. Um, we can do. We're doing some other interesting things where we're, we're expanding into new markets. So the scan data we get back, because we're also, you can buy, you know, from our online store in Canada, the U.S. or Amazon. We can look at where people are scanning it worldwide and say, hmm, why is everybody scanning it in Missouri, for instance? What's going on there? And then go approach stores there saying, hey, listen, we're selling coffee into that market. You should carry our product. And we have all the data. So you're doing advanced market research for them, quite literally. Um, yeah, it is. And, and you know, we're... We sort of formed a bit of a consortium where we're dealing with some other like-minded businesses that aren't direct competitors um, so that we can pool information. So some of these guys are bigger than us, some of them are smaller. But the idea is if you look at sort of organic and fair trade type products, you know, whether it be, um, oh, I don't know, grains or cereals or juices or whatever, mm -hmm. there's a certain synergistic component to that. So by having them have access to our data – anonymously yep. and us having access to theirs we can work better together and we're working on like some couponing things saying if you scan this oh well did you know i know what store you're in when you're doing this yeah yeah did you know that you can buy this product with this product and get a discount right now yeah i i love that, fun with that that gets me excited because when you start to think about you know, I, I'm not a big a guy. Uh, I think that you have to drive revenue through mobile. And if you're going to drive revenue through mobile, it's about getting people off of their seat and mm -hmm. into a store. Yeah. Um, and then uh, if they're in the store uh, and they've got the product in hand, uh, don't give them a discount on that product. Go and drive them to somebody else's product or another complementary product, right? Yeah. You know, don't take money out of your pocket. Give them a discount on the next purchase. Right, right. Yeah. And, and do it in a seamless way. Uh, so those kind of relationships, I mean, marketers have been doing this forever, but it just seems like the mobile industry has kind of, uh, you know, gone coupon crazy. They've bastardized the definition of a coupon yep. right? by giving you a discount, basically taking revenue out of your hand, out of the retailer's hands. And I think people are getting... Well, the, the, well, the, the flip side of that is that um, the retailer isn't paying for that, you know, it's no. the people like us. <laughs> yeah, you guys. I mean, the, the money, people forget, the money's got to come from somewhere. It's either reduced margins or a marketing budget or something to that extent. That, But the money, it doesn't just... I mean, you don't just give 30% off a product and, and, and not have repercussions, right? Or, well, exactly, yeah. So uh, so that's a really interesting uh, piece to it, which is to to bring other companies that are like-minded, you know, complementary products, yeah. and uh, and draw attention to them because you have that, basically, that influence grows and grows and grows, and, and yeah. you can do it. And so when I scan, when somebody scans a, um, the QR code, you're gathering information on that anonymously, which is which is fine. Um, yeah, we and we will have in the future ability to opt in because you may want to know from us when we're on deal in your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, but that's and, what I'm getting to. So this is a really great. This is that gap. So, uh, you know, uh, when you when you send a product, and as you said, it kind of it disappears. Like you ship the Loblaws. That's the last you see of it, kind of right. Uh, yeah. So you'll get you'll get reports from them about how many how many units are sold and. Um, but it, it, it does you a great deal of good service to to help promote those products and obviously sell them and create the relationship with the Absolutely. customer. It helps them. I mean, the more products they move, the happy they are. Yeah. Uh, and firstly, when we're talking to our coffee growers, and they say, well, why would I care about social media? And, well, if people get engaged in your story 
and you're authentic, they'll buy more coffee. Yep. And then we'll have to buy more coffee from you. Yeah. It's that simple. And they go, oh, okay. Okay, you fine. Know. Yeah. Well, it's brand building. <laughs> what you tell me sometimes, like you say, you know, Maria had a healthy baby boy. That's awesome. You know, connect on a on a personal level to people. Yeah, well, I, I think I think that that's that's why um, I mean that's why this, this can work so well is that uh, you know your your brand building, um, you're creating a relationship with your end customer, which is something that is so unique. You know, I I often talk about the fact that that stores, big chain stores, that owned the brand and you sold your product through that brand are no longer as viable because everybody's going to have an, an affinity to an individual brand or product, right? It's going to come down to the product level. Anyways, that's very true. Um, like private label coffee typically doesn't do as well as branded coffee because it's usually cheaper, which means they probably bought an inferior product to begin with and you can't make bad coffee good. Yep. You, know, you certainly make good coffee bad. Um, <laughs> and uh, so in that, in that area that Brands are really important. It's not like, uh, I don't know, say like mashed potatoes or something where right. whatever. Yeah, it's whatever's on sale at that point. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so you, I mean, where, where do you see that going? Like, you guys are in there. you got the QR codes. You're driving traffic to yourself. You're creating a relationship. You might actually be getting them to opt into a mailing list so that they can you can send future deals directly to them and not yeah. rely on, the, on the, the store to actually promote the product, which is, yeah. which is pretty powerful. It is, and it's going to change things because I think you see more and more of this stuff. And you know, the example that was given to me a while ago was uh, just by um, a fellow I, I, I knew went into a, a Toys R Us actually, yep. and was buying a, a baby seat for his car. Scanned it, found it was cheaper online, ordered it there after already looking at it in the store. And going, geez, this thing's really big in this box. Oh, they'll ship it to me for free, and it's cheaper. Oh, done. <laughs> so I mean. Retailers are going to have to, it's going to happen. So I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how they uh, react to that. Because I mean, if I was a retailer and I saw somebody doing that, I'd be kind of choked. But what are you going to do? Well, that's, uh, you know, Best Buy is the same way. I mean, Chapters yeah. and Indigo here in Canada is that uh, people are, are, are uh, being driven to the store by good advertising and good marketing that is being fronted by Best Buy, by the chains. And then... Um, and then doing their uh, window shopping in the store and purchasing online, uh, and that's yeah. that's a frightening, frightening scenario. You know, I I, I, I have to admit that I, I do that with movies. I go into a video store sometimes. I'll take a picture with my phone, say, and then I'll go uh, rent it online. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's it's it can be very destructive unless you embrace that. And uh, you yeah, because one of the things we've done is we've engaged a lot locally in Vancouver with uh, a lot of the sort of charities and other things yeah. we support. We do a lot of work in this area and we look at mobile as a way to take part of that and be local in Ottawa like in yeah. your living room yeah. where you can get content and the content has to be relevant and useful and accurate because yeah. um, we can't be everywhere at the same time no uh, but you know with, with, with this it, it allows you to uh, you know as you said you're collecting all this data to begin with and, and by opening this up you're 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 basically creating a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody in a unique way that that will draw me in right so when i did my research on you guys i, I i'm a loblaws shopper there i am in loblaws with a with a qr code scanner scanning your product right uh, you know oh good i get to see what this thing actually does yeah. exactly right but that's that's the appeal of it especially you know the technology and what kind of information and the beautiful thing is that it's not stagnant it's not printed once yeah. distributed you did exactly and that's the key of it um because if you scan a upc code that's a static object right and that's really kind of useless. I mean, that's sort of, you know, and I'm scanning QR codes like on bottles of wine and it's exactly the same as the label. And I'm going, Wait okay, a <laughs> I'm wasting my time and it's, there's no value here. So uh, you've, you've got it in the store. So you're trying to create that relationship uh, with, with the, the end consumer. You're trying to drive revenue up for the product. Um, you know, maybe that leads to better placement, but it certainly leads to replenished orders from, from the stores. Yes. How do you how do you deal with the fact that you are also online selling online and in stores? So ultimately, couldn't I scan it, find a better price online with free shipping from you guys, and then have it sent out? Or no, we're pretty cautious about that. We yeah. don't don't you know even if you come to our roastery cafe, yeah, our prices are typically we have a suggested list price, and that's what we say. Okay. Now, if people want to charge more or less, I can't stop them from doing that. Typically, they charge a bit less. Yeah. So because you don't want ever. You know, undermine your retail partners. No, you don't. That, it's, it's a big challenge. Yeah. So, so we don't. Do that. So I mean, the majority of our business is still you know bricks and mortar. So and uh, 
when when you uh, say you wanted to offer a coupon, for example, like you know, I, I can see this happening very very well. Is that um, you create a direct relationship uh, with with the end consumer? So I walk in, I scan it, I buy the product, I sign up for your mailing list, I get a coupon. Um, is that would that be in conjunction with the store, or I mean, how would that work? Um, that's an interesting thing. It hasn't quite sorted itself out okay. yet. Okay. Because every uh, well, not well, pretty much. Like, look, look at this. Every retailer has their own system. Yes. That's a legacy system. Yeah. It may be a hybrid of a whole bunch of old stuff. It works, but yeah. it's not. It doesn't go across, you know, multiple store locations. So you've got some coupon aggregators out there um, that charge a fair amount of money for that service. And you know, even if we generated right now a mobile coupon on an iPhone or an Android or a BlackBerry most likely the retailer would not be able to scan it yet. Yeah, they would kind of look at it the same way that, you know, when I walk up with a, uh, you know, my, my quick pass or pay pass for Starbucks or something like that, the, the barista yeah. looks at it and says, what is that? Why are you showing me that? You know? Yeah, great. <laughs> it's an education piece. But, you know, I, I, there, is, there is coming that day and we, where, where it's not so much about buying this in a Radio Shack or a Best Buy. It's about the product itself. So it's basically a nameless pr company or a nameless uh, v a vehicle for, uh, uh, for buying something, but the product is the brand. And, and uh, you know, ultimately, you've got to create those relationships with the consumer. Yeah. But yeah. you're... Go ahead. No, I said I, I was um, at a Best Buy when actually the iPad 2 launched. I was happened to be in LA at the time. And I was really impressed by their use of QR codes as for product information. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And I just went, oh, well, that's really cool. Wow, well, that's and I exactly it. I can't remember how much money they save every year, too, based on, you know, just not printing tags. It's huge. Yeah. And, and I just went, and the more people get used to these things, the, you know, the more and more it'll get prevalent. You start seeing them, wow, the QR codes are in a lot of places. Yeah. Then you necessarily see them, think them, see them, you know, or, um, and they should be used more. Um, I've been talking to like some display advertising people, and they're saying, you know, because sometimes we consider advertising, we typically don't. Yeah. But if you've got a bunch of bulletin boards around, how do I know that one's worth more than this one? Yep. Well, they don't know. Well, geez, if you put a QR code on these things, it's pretty amazing. I mean, they, yeah. they judge it by traffic, right? By uh, by how many cars go by or how many people walk by. But yeah, the same thing. It's like, it's like trying to say, I'm going to build. Uh, a retail store without having any demographic and traffic information. That's right. I mean, that's stupid. Yeah. And, you know, it's an interesting problem retailers are going to have in that space, too, because they're aggregated, aggregators of stuff that you want to get at one time. Yeah. And if you can get a better, cheaper, faster somewhere else, you know, I mean, typically they're real estate companies primarily, and they rent those little chunks of space. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you just think about the repercussions of all of this is that um, – for the first time in quite some time, if you opt into this, uh, it's it's the most measurable it can be, right? You, yeah, you, you can absolutely. actually you, you measure the impact on anything that you do, um, and and uh, but you guys are taking it not only in the store, you're you're creating the story of the coffee bean, which I think is which is incredible, and uh, you know there's so many layers you can put onto that. Uh, oh yeah, you, know, no, you can almost you... adopt you can adopt the people that are that are uh, quite literally picking the beans, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're working on. You know, more enhanced communication. We're working on a lot, a lot more, um, even education. Yeah. Is you know, it's great to talk about you know, let's say acidity or whatever it is in your cup of coffee. But if you don't know what the hell that is, that's kind of a pointless conversation. So we got some pretty interesting stuff coming out soon that'll, I think, be quite innovative on how you do that. Well, I, I look at uh, you know uh, the wine industry is the same as the coffee industry, right? Which is uh, the wine right, so the wine industry is a palate. Right. Yes. Ultimately, it's a palate, and the coffee industry is a palate as well. There's enough brands out there, enough roasters out there, um, that what Gary Vaynerchuk is doing on Wine Library TV or Daily Grape uh, about wine tasting, why isn't anybody really impacting that on, on or doing the same thing on, on the coffee side, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, it is an industry, and I think Starbucks or Seattle's Best or all these other companies that were there at the beginning um, really you know, curated the coffee industry 30 years ago when oh, they started. Yeah. You're also doing something that's unique with with driving people. So you do any of your print ads or your your uh, your advertising. You're you're driving people to the stores to actually yeah. go and buy the product. So yeah. it's not just about being in the aisle and seeing the product and scanning it and being there and by happenstance or serendipity. You're actually driving people in. Talk about that process that you're using there. Well, I mean, it's you know it, it comes down to sales when we want you to buy yes. our coffee and not somebody else's and it's you know it's pure and simple and you know I think I said a bit earlier was like 
Okay, transparency, a good story, changing content, um, and then you need to have some other incentives. If we were, if you went into, let's say, a law of laws, scan the product, and we offered it to you cheaper through another method, I bet you that's a pretty fast way to get delisted. Yeah, <laughs> so <laughs> pretty, pretty quick. What we need to do is support the chain. So that means looking forward, so we want to make sure that the people we sell to are honest and ethical yeah. as, as the people we buy from. I mean, it's just a, it's, it, it's a continuum of gain to cup yeah. or grower to consumer. Yeah. And as long as everybody behaves, hey, we're happy to do business with you. You know, if you're going to not pay us on time, we're not going to sell you coffee. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And the same thing with the growers. I mean, beyond the fair trade and organic, if it's crappy, we won't buy it. And if you don't deliver, we probably won't buy from you next year. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's based on trust. And the world needs a lot more of that. Oh, I mean, I agree. And, and well, transparency helps with trust, doesn't it? It's forced trust. You can't, you know, call your company Ethical Bean and not, and, you know, live in a little... <laughs> right. And be like, like hey, I can get you a better deal of that over here. Right? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. I, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of companies, you're not a big company, you're a small company, um, and you're selling into big chains. And, and ultimately, um, you know, five years ago or eight years ago or 10 years ago, your ability to influence sales in a big chain with a small budget is oh, absolutely. tiny, right? Yeah, yeah. Flash forward to what you're doing right now in mobile is that now you're thinking about strategies to help support a, a, a chain like Loblaws sell your pro more of your product. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we want, yeah, because they're not just going there to buy coffee. Right. Yeah, you it's know. not a destination. Yeah. No. Oh, I need coffee. Go drive to Loblaws for, you know. No, you're going to go buy it to your shopping. Yeah. But but isn't that, a, that's such a, that's a, that's that's pretty incredible that that the technology or the technology that mobile I mean, mobile technology can allow you to do things on that are not expensive that you're that complement your existing marketing or or, uh, or advertising budget that can actually help support uh, Loblaws because they must love that as well. Yeah, they do, and because um, and, and you're going to see more of that from all sorts of different ways, and it's going to get you know if you look at the difference from like ten years ago to today. Well, imagine look, so it's. What's, what's going to be like in two years? I in know. three years? In six I months? Mean, I don't even know. Uh, you know I, we've got roadmaps and plans, but they're kind of guidelines. I mean, it's, it's going to evolve, and it's going to be like, you're going to see some really cool stuff, and we go, that's really neat. Yeah. Huh. How can I apply that to what I'm trying to do? Well, what, what, I mean, last train of thought here, last, last train of questions here is, on that note, I mean, when you look at the technology that's coming down, or, or, or I mean, what's your mindset as you're, as you're trying to determine what, you know, what you guys should bring into the company from a technology standpoint. I mean, do you have like, um, is are there are there bars that it has to pass? Like, you know, step one, does it generate revenue? Step two, does it does it drive brand awareness? Step three, does it help the uh, the retailer? I mean, what are, what are your parameters to be able to bring? Basically, technology? we want to we want to look at it as either increasing sales, decreasing costs, and it being measurable. And some stuffs more or less measurable than other things. Yeah, I mean. In December, we were one of Oprah's favorite things in our magazine, and through the magazine distribution, you, you, you don't you can see an effect, but you can't isolate that so much from maybe something else we were doing. Right, right. You can because she's Oprah, but to a certain degree. But if you if you can't measure what you're doing, yeah. you know we know how many apps have been downloaded, we know how many scans have been done, we know where that's happened, and you know we can learn from that, and then in the future, you know. Faster processors, faster networks, better cameras all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, ease of development, um, and then we'll streamline it so it's you can get it to the information you care about faster and provide more of it. Well, and what about reviews? Like, I mean, when I scan a product of yours, um, will it will it uh, will it give me the um, the outcome or review of, of consumers that have bought the product and what they're feeling about? Soon. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, and you, you'll be able to uh, compare yourself against other people, yeah. Um, and as sort of a social networking kind of thing. And uh, if you're, if you know, if you're way off base, like if it's you know, if it's a copy that really has no acidity, and you say, "Oh, the acidity is oh, it's great stuff." Like, we might actually talk to you about that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it could be but it's exactly what you're you're saying. But if you're way too out of the norm, yeah. it's you know, as an outlier, we can actually intervene. Yeah, well, which will be. That's what that's what's beautiful about uh, about this industry is that uh, you, you know especially with something like QR codes or whatever happens with uh, near field communications or something like that where 
um, w- w- you know, where, where you're, you're encompassing a product uh, with basically a link, right? So that it's, it's digital ink, it never dries, you can, you can change it as you go. Um, and you can add you can add to it as you go, and uh, yeah. ultimately you'll be able to lobby a store that doesn't carry ethical bean coffee to be able to bring that in, right? Based Absolutely. on your data in your neighborhood, without naming names, you know we sell this type of product mix in these things, and everybody knows who their competitors are, yeah. and they go, oh, and here's the data. Yeah. So, I mean, would you have been able to do this w- without mobile, Lloyd? Is this something that you that it makes it a lot easier. Okay. Uh, we certainly couldn't do all the stuff you see in the app. Yeah. You know, um, we could have done that on a website, but it it loses its its immediacy. I mean, I would rather scan the bag when I'm in the aisle. Yeah. Then go home, go to my you know, ethicalbean.com and type in the you know code. That's just just way too much work. Yeah. You can do that. I mean, um, you know, if you scan it with a, a BlackBerry or a, an Android, it does give you a mobile version of our site that has most of the information. Yeah. We can't quite do all the fun stuff we can on an iPhone. Um, but, you know, it's the immediacy, it's the quick feedback, so, you know, even the, like, a, like a 3G camera, yeah, not so good. GS, okay. Four, awesome. Yeah. You know, and it's just that, you know, if you look at some of the older Blackberries and, and such, um, cameras weren't really any good for this type of stuff at all. No. No, I mean, it, it, they were just they were just there to capture a moment. Um, yeah. And, totally. and now, what we expect these cameras to be are replacements for our existing cameras, our digital cameras that we yeah. used to carry with us. So the quality has to be there. Um, so y- y- a different perspective, though, coming out from a retail uh, uh, outlet um, or retail product. Um, you know, the, the pressures of, of getting a, a technology product out there can be overwhelming um, and consumers can be very demanding um, when it's an app that needs to work on a continuous basis. But are you finding that uh, what you guys are doing is like people are a little bit more patient as you're rolling these things out uh, on multiple platforms and different functionality? Uh, we haven't had too many issues. We've had a couple sort of outages from time to time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, we haven't got any negative feedback really on that, and which is interesting. Sometimes we've been out like maybe for a couple hours and then we find out, oh crap. <laughs> but, uh, we're getting better at that. I mean, we are yeah, first, but- almost a, a coffee roaster and we do actually host our own servers here, but um, yeah, I mean, it, this is so new and novel and it, it's free. Yeah. So people just go, oh, cool, I get a map. Oh, I get to see Aaron, Aaron's cupping scores in his video. I get to, you know, visit the farm virtually, you know. Yeah. It, and add more. Now, so did you did you put a budget together for this? Uh, I'm not so good at budgets. Okay, so I mean, you, you just had a feeling that this is what you wanted to do, and you kind of looked around and you said, "This yeah, is this." I mean, I've been a, you know I've been technology before, so I wasn't all that frightened of it. Um, and we hired a, a young guy, young meaning younger than me, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, he built it really quite quickly. Yeah, because really, it's it's a relational database, and once you get the structure right. The content's the content. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was managing the workflows, make sure that we captured the information at the right times here, so that we could assemble it and show it to you. Yeah. And so once the problem's been understood, it was a fairly straightforward engineering um, project, where you know the app itself isn't terribly smart; it just knows how to display the content we feed it. Right, and that's the way that it should be, really. Uh... So, I mean, so we make changes in the back end all the time, and the app functions differently. So, I mean, would you, uh, when you when you look forward to this, is that uh, uh, when other brands, you know, you're paving the way or you're doing something that's unique and other brands are going to start to do these things, right? You know, competitors are going to look at what you're doing and they're going to say, well, we should be doing that as well. So it's going to be parity at some point. Um, you know, have you given thought to what that next step is beyond well, that? Well, I mean, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, we got into fair trade and organic coffee when it was still a pretty small industry. Yeah. You know, you, you, as a, any business, you have to be able to move faster and hopefully smarter than your, than everybody else in your in your space. And that's sort of the true, you know, the way competition works. Yeah. And so we just are going to continue to move quickly, quickly and smarter, and, and then anybody well, else. Well, sometimes things work out better than other times. I mean, that was a really stupid idea, like. Oh. <laughs> Have you done that? Have you done that yet? Where you where you look? Have you done that where, where you think, yeah, well, we shouldn't have done that? Yeah, well, actually, one of the 
stupidest things I did is that I said, hey, you know what we're going to call the app? Ethical Bean. But we're going to spell it B-E-N. So, like, where has the ethics been? <laughs> Nobody got it. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> that wasn't terribly right. But, I mean, you know, uh, other things. You try different markets, different product mixes sometimes, and sometimes they work, and sometimes they knock it out of the park. So, so uh, last question, Lloyd, is, is there any reason why companies like yourselves or any other uh, um, consumer-facing uh, product company shouldn't embrace mobile? No, but it's going to be an interesting way to, or for some of these people to embrace it themselves. Um, <clears throat> when you're talking about like fair trade organic coffees, if you're a conventional coffee roaster, yeah, you, you, you might feel a little uncomfortable about disclosing certain things. Sure. Right? Or proprietary information. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because there's... Not there's there's a lot of fair trade coffee in the world, but you know, we all buy from the same guys. Yeah. You know, and if I look at my competitors' package and I cup their coffee, I I kind of know what their roast profile is anyway. Yeah. You know, and if they even have our roast profile, like them scanning it, you know, their machine's going to behave differently anyway. Yeah. So, and we're already onto the next batch. So I mean, that's old news. Yeah. They didn't copy the past stuff. That's okay. <laughs> if it helps them out, it helps them out. You know, the world needs better coffee anyway. Well, you know, it's, I mean, I, yeah, I think that there are certain things that you don't like. I don't want to know where uh, the history of my hot dog. I don't, I don't need no, to know that. You don't want to know that, unless, of course, it's a really great history. Yeah, like, it, like the history of your veggie dog. Yeah, veggie that, dog is fine, and maybe yeah. for for uh, you know for uh, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, I'd like them to know where that's been, but I don't need to know. I don't need to yeah, know where. Yeah, exactly. I, but but so you're right. I, I guess every company and every approach should be taken a little bit differently. Like you you have a great story to tell. You're telling the history of the bean, and and you're yeah. you're enlightening us to fair trade. It's fairly easy. Some people also have uh, very complicated products that it's hard to source everything down, and sometimes it's proprietary. And if it goes through a few brokers, sometimes the broker says, "Well, why do you want to know that information?" Because they're concerned they might get cut out, right? Yeah. Um, which then should prompt a discussion saying, why are you so scared? Exactly. Why are you paranoid? <laughs> or what are you doing there? Exactly. Is that two hands in the pocket right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm always fascinated by, by finding a, a good mix of, of technology and real life business. And, and I think that, uh, but what I found here is, is just a little bit deeper than that is that, you know, a technologist married to a designer influenced by Apple and the branding that, that uh, you know, has evolved in Apple throw in a good mix of technology with a beautiful story behind that technology and behind the bean itself. And you've got quite a compelling reason um, to embrace mobile and, and to follow the brand, right? I think that... Yeah, well, we think so. I mean, we sort of, that was, that was our thinking. I mean, when we started off, I mean, if you looked at Fair Trader, you had a copy, a lot of you know, greens and browns and sort of yeah. green packaging. I mean, our packaging is bright silver. It's mm -hmm. meant to be more mainstream. Yep. You know, it's not, you know, don't take offense, PC owners, but it's not like an ugly black... PC box. It's a beautifully designed Apple. Yeah, rounded machine. edges, smooth. It evokes an emotion, right? Yeah. Well, you know, Lloyd, I'm 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 really impressed. You know, I'm not surprised. Um, and uh, but I'm really impressed that, uh, you know, I, I look at the way that retail is going to evolve, and I think that what you guys are doing is is at the forefront of the way that retail is going to evolve, and and creating a brand out of a product. And not letting the store be the brand, I think, is another big trend that's going to be happening. And and uh, and so, how do companies close that gap between their product and their customer, right? Yeah. Your customer is your customer. It's not a Loblaws customer. It just happens to be in that in that vessel. Yeah, exactly. It's a facilitation. It is. So kudos to that. Uh, you know, um, well, you. appreciate that. Knew there was a big story here, and uh, and I, I think that it should be told more often. And uh, I, I'm hoping that I can I can help in any way to to tell that story through I through this. It. This is great. I really had, uh, had a fun time talking with you. Well, you know, so uh, people can find out about you obviously from from the website right now at uh, ethicalbean.com. B e a n, that, not b e n. Right. Yeah, yeah. I learned that lesson. <laughs> That's right. Maybe. And uh, they can download the app from uh, from iTunes or the App Store, yeah. uh, and 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 you can use any QR code scanner for Android and BlackBerry. It just takes you to a mobile web version of the. Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, and uh, and you're in Vancouver, and uh, you have a little uh, you have a coffee shop in Vancouver, uh, obviously in the front of uh, of your your uh, location. 
yeah, I'm going to drink coffee if you're in the business. But uh, we do tours as well and cuppings and, you know, I come by it. and see how coffee gets roasted if anybody's interested. I love it. I love it. So you can buy online. So big chains in the in Canada, which are Loblaws, the, the typical ones, and then you're moving into the States. Yeah, and points points east. Okay. From here, so point C's from across. Actually, west from here would be closer. Yes. But uh, we're we're looking at some Asian markets at the moment as well. I love it, and a Canadian company. Uh, I just, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm beaming with Canadian pride. I think that this is uh, this is great, and it, it doesn't surprise me, as I said, that that uh, technology and coffee have intertwined into this into this spot. Yeah, well, you certainly drink, as you know, a lot of coffee when you're coding or exactly involved in this stuff. So it's uh, it's lifeblood. Yeah. But it's the same thing, you know, uh, people would always say instead of investing, instead of buying coffee, Tim Hortons coffee, invest in the stock, right? It's the yeah. same thing that people say, you know, if you had taken all your money that you spent in Apple product and bought stock, I mean, you would have you would have made a gazillion dollars as a result. Don't bring that up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, Actually, I, I do own some Apple stock and, I, you know, when they were down around 10 bucks, I was like, I should buy some. Yeah. Go! Gold at, gold at $400, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Why, that's too expensive. Yeah, it's gonna go down. Yeah. Wow. So, I, I, thank you, Lloyd. I really appreciate yep. it. Uh, I've been speaking with Lloyd Bernhardt, who is a co-founder of the Ethical Coffee, uh, the Ethical Bean Coffee uh, Company, and based out of Vancouver, but online at ethicalbean.com in your grocery store. Um, really great use of, of QR codes to enhance the product um, and uh, and really to help market the product, which is a which is a pretty incredible thing. So go to ethicalbean.com, download the app if you have a, a, a mobile device or an, a, an iPhone or any QR code to scan uh, any of the QR uh, codes that are actually on, on the device if you're using an Android or BlackBerry. Lloyd, thank you so much for doing this. I really Thanks. appreciate it. I really appreciate it. For those guys who are still watching, I know you are. You've found a ton of value in here. Uh, go and use it. Go and spread it. If you have any comments or suggestions, uh, reach out to me at untether at gmail.com. And that is another episode of Untether.tv. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you.